Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us at the UCD Institute of Food and Health Research Bites. So I'm delighted that Dr. Angela Feechin is going to talk to us today, and she's going to discuss host pathogen interactions in cereals. So just to introduce Angela briefly, she did her undergraduate in plant science and her PhD in plant disease resistance at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. She then completed a postdoc, and that was in the University of Copenhagen in Denmark, and then went on to the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia. And there she was working on fungal crop pathogen powdery mildew. She came to Ireland in 2013, which is the year she also received a Marie Curie Career Reintegration Grant. And her research is in the area of plant microbe interactions and her focus particularly as to how fungal pathogens can infect and cause disease in cereal crops. So certainly a very important topic for Irish agriculture. So over to you, Angela, and thanks very much. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to tell you about some of the work that we've um, been doing. There was a bit of a sneak peek of that earlier when I uh, went forward a little bit. But so we work on a few different crop pathogens um, in my lab. Um, we focus mainly on um, wheat. Um, we do some work on oats um, and we have a new project on barley as well. Um, but mainly I'll talk about some of the work what we, that we have been doing on a crop pathogen um, that infects wheat today. OK, so this is... Um, This is um, this, the symptoms that you get when you have a septoria uh, triticide blotch infection. So if you look closely at the tips of the leaves, you'll see that there's, they're very yellow. And if you kind of went in and had a look at the leaves, you would see that they have these um, kind of lesions on them, these brown lesions with yellow margins. And inside there's these little black dots. And those little black dots are actually the asexual um, fruiting bodies. Okay, So they're chocked full of spores. Uh, and that's how the pathogen uh, reproduces. Okay, so wheat's the second uh, largest crop in Ireland after barley. And most of the fungicides uh, that are applied onto wheat are actually to try and control this disease, uh, or septoria, um, because it can cause quite uh, serious yield losses. So the main way uh, to control it at the moment is, is fungicides. And actually that's become even more uh, problematic in the last year or so because um, as of last May, May 2020, um, chlorothalonil, which was one of the main multi-sites, um, was no longer, we can no longer use that to control septoria um, on wheat. And so this is really in line with a, um, EU legislation. So for example, the new farm to fork an EU bio um, diversity strategy to try and reduce um, inputs, so reduce pesticides um, and reduce fertilizers. So there's really less um, there's less um, opportunities to use fungicides uh, as we go forward. Okay, so then you're really looking at um, resistance. Okay, so resistance in in the wheat variety. So is there resistance to septoria and wheat? There is. Um, there's 22 resistance genes to this um, particular disease. Okay, so it's a fungus. Um, there are 22 resistance genes to septoria. We've actually only uh, cloned, so the community has only cloned two of those uh, resistance genes. One's STB6, uh, which is present in a lot of uh, European wheat varieties, and the other one is STBQ16, which was uh, just recently uh, published. So what do we know about these resistance genes? Well, in terms of the one that's been cloned, we know it sits in the cell wall. Um, okay, so this is a bit of a cartoon of septoria, so the brown uh, kind of spore there on the surface of the leaf. Um, septoria tries to get in through stomata, okay, so in the top left hand corner, you see uh, one of the stomata on wheat and hopefully you can see it looks like a little blue worm. Okay, so that's actually the septoria spore trying to force its way, uh, trying to get into that uh, stomata on wheat. Once it's in, it starts to grow between the cells. And again, if you look for the blue color, 
um, in the bigger panel uh, labelled B, you'll see that there's a blue, almost, uh, I guess, again, a worm or a snake going between those two, between those cells um, in the wheat leaf. And that's what Septoria does. It grows between um, the cells in the, what's called the apoplast, the, the space between the cells. So we know that one of these resistance genes actually sits kind of on the cell wall um, as a sensor, I guess, as a receptor. And what we know so far is that this resistance gene uh, senses the presence of a protein that actually comes from the fungus. Okay, so the resistance gene is basically looking to see um, is there proteins that are secre secreted from this uh, fungus, this septoria fungus. Actually, there's hundreds of proteins that are secreted from septoria. Okay, so the fungus is uh, secreting around 490 proteins. Okay, um, only 250 of them are small, and only 100 of them contain cysteines. Why is that important? That's important because remember I said that the fungus is grown between the cell walls and the apoplast, and that's quite an inhospitable environment. It's quite acidic. So if you're going to secrete proteins into that environment, uh, they need to be able to uh, resist that uh, kind of acidity and so cysteine is a really good way of keeping those proteins um, in the right kind of uh, um, the right second, the right structure, okay, the right shape. So there's so there's a hundred of these uh, proteins that are getting secreted into the into the plant, into the leaf. Um, we really don't know what they do. We only know what a handful of them do. Uh, one of them is one that I described that is recognised by one of the few resistance genes that have been cloned. Um, another one of them acts like a cloaking device, so it actually sticks to the surface, the outside surface of the fungus, and tries to hide the fungus from basically the plant's immune system. Okay? So it looks like a lot of these secreted proteins um, are to do with... Um, trying to hide from the plant's immune system, uh, trying to um, basically aid the ability of this pathogen, of this fungus, to get into the plant and, and start to feed. So what we've been doing is trying to work out what some of these uh, small secreted proteins do, because we, we really don't have much knowledge about how this fungus is aggressive and what it's doing um, inside wheat. things that says that it only after about nine days uh, you start to see symptoms and you can see that hopefully in the bottom set of leaves um, the top set are just a control and you can see that there's no infection they're nice green leaves there whereas the bottom uh, set of leaves there you start to see uh, yellow and, and brown lesions around uh, the 9, 10 day mark. And then by, you know, 15 days, you started to see all those little black dots, uh, which, are, which are actually the asexual um, fruit and bodies. I think I have a, yeah. So you, you can see in this image that's just come up, there's lots of little um, um, white cirri. Okay, so there's like almost like a gel comes out of these little um, fruit and bodies. And that is again chopped full of these spores. So when the rain comes down, and there's a lot of rain in Ireland, rain comes down, it smacks into those little um, curly cirri that are chopped full of, of spores, and those get spread um, through the canopy. So yeah, so for the first nine days, there's not you can't actually see symptoms of infection. And there's a lot of debate about what Septoria is actually doing for those first uh, nine days. <laughs> um, and we found one of these small secreted proteins that's expressed really early at two days post infection. Okay, so that's one of the points where you can't actually see any infection. So we became quite interested um, in this uh, protein, this small secreted protein from the fungus. And we had a bit of a closer look at it. So as well as being expressed really early in infection, so just two days after infection, um, one of the other things that we found is that this um, protein or a homologue, a very similar protein, 
is found in lots of other plant pathogens. Um, so there's a closely, closely related fungus that infects barley uh, called Ramularia, and it has a very similar uh, protein. There's one in a banana pathogen, there's one in a related fungus that infects um, sugar beet. Um, and also, so if you look at the group of fungi that actually have this protein, um, they're all plant pathogens. Um, and there's two kind of interesting ones in blue. If you can see the blue dots there, those are actually um, animal pathogens. So I don't know, it's interesting to see uh, what, the, what this actually does. So what does this actually do inside the plant? Okay, so we, if it's, infect, if it's infecting and getting secreted into the plant, does have anything to do with uh, the genes or the proteins that are actually inside the wheat plant. And we sent uh, this protein off and a screen was done by a company called Hybrogenics. And they looked to see if it interacts, physically interacts with any wheat proteins. And what they found was that it interacts with a protein called um, a ubiquitin ligase. Okay, so we know that because in this yeast 2 hybrid, um, hopefully you can see there's more of a blue dot where there's a physical interaction between the septoria protein and the wheat protein. We were also able to prove that um, by a physical interaction um, doing, a, doing a pull down and also we did some experiments uh, with fluorescent microscopy. So this uh, ubiquitin ligase, what does it do? Well, again, there are lots of very similar proteins in lots of cereals. Um, you can see a list in this um, figure. And this protein um, basically tags um, proteins in the cell to degrade them. Okay? And we know that ligase, these kind of E3 ligases, tag uh, proteins that are involved in plant immunity. So we think what's happening is that the fungus is secreting protein to basically mess up the levels of the proteins that are involved in the plant's immune system. Okay? So the plant has lots of defense um, genes and defense proteins and by targeting these E3 ligases you mess up um, how many uh, proteins there are that are involved in the plant's immune system. Okay, so basically <clears throat> this is kind of the real point of the whole uh, last couple of minutes is that if you take this protein in wheat and you silence it, okay, you silence this gene in wheat and we did that, um, if you look at A, you can see that two, um, some of the bars are much lower and those are silenced for this gene. So with these wheat plants are no longer expressing this ligase, E3 ligase. We counted the number of little black dots, which are the fruiting bodies, which make the spores. And there were many more spores, many more pycnidia produced uh, when you have this gene silenced. And what that tells us is that this gene is required for resistance. So you need the E3 ligase to regulate the plant's immune system probably, um, and it's needed for resistance. And what septoria does is secrete a protein to basically mess up um, the plant's immune system. So we just, uh, this is just actually this uh, February issue of, of um, the Journal of Export, so we just um, published this. And just uh, one of the other proteins that we became really interested in uh, was um, because of some work that was going on in Fiona's lab. So while we were working to see what the pathogen was doing, what the pathogen was secreting, uh, Fiona's lab were looking to see if there were resistance uh, proteins in a wheat variety called uh, Stig. And they found uh, some resistance genes in Stig. Now Stig um, was on the recommended list for a couple of years. Um, it came off because it has a low uh, yield potential, but it is really resistant to septoria. And these resistance genes, which are called um, SSP6 and SSP7, were found to actually again interact with some of these uh, secreted proteins from uh, septoria. 
we became really interested in, in one of these and why we became interested in it is because it's kind of the opposite from the previous gene that I described. So instead of being expressed early, this one's expressed at the transition, okay, so the transition to necrosis. And it is unique to septoria, it's not found in any other fungus. And that was some work that was done actually by uh, Reen Lawless, who, who was a master student. So she found that this was only, um, only found in the septoria fungus, not in other uh, fungal pathogens. Um, and we know that this is a really diverse um, protein as well. Okay, so this is some work that was done as part of the CONSUS project. We have a, a collection of septoria isolates from different sites um, in the UK, and we know that this is a really diverse um, small secreted protein. So there's lots of different, there seems to be about seven different versions of it in the, in the, in the pathogen population. We don't, know, we don't really know why, why that is. Okay, so this was knocked out. Um, again, uh, this was part of uh, Clean's Masters as well. And uh, when you knock this out, you can see that uh, there are not very many little black dots on the two bottom uh, panels. So the uh, wild, so the septoria, usually by about 15 days, you've got lots and lots of spores produced, lots and lots of pycnidia, but you don't see that when you knock out uh, this gene. So we know, again, that this gene seems to be really important uh, for aggressiveness and virulence uh, for the pathogen. Okay, so just to kind of summarise that, we know that the septoria pathogen is using small secreted proteins to try and promote disease to help aggressiveness. Um, we looked at two, well, we we're looking at more, but these are the ones that I've described today. Uh, one of them seems to be really conserved, expressed early, and seems to mess around with the plant's immune system by binding this ubiquitin lysase. And the other one is expressed late. It seems to be really unique to this uh, particular pathogen. And again, seems to be required for uh, aggressiveness uh, and disease. Just to say again that we do work on uh, powdery mildew and we do that in wheat and um, oats. And Ashling has just finished a nice project looking at resistance genes in heritage and commercial varieties in oats and looking to see which resistance genes are in them. Um, and Tony was looking at a, a biostimulant product uh, from Altec and found that that could protect against uh, powdery mildew. Uh, and we, we actually have, um, this is my last slide. So this is, uh, this is a, a project that we uh, just started. Okay, so we got funding from DAFM last year. It was a two million project. And it's looking to see if you can use biostimulants and biopesticides um, to try and alleviate the kind of dependence on um, fossil fuels, uh, fossil based fertilizers um, and pesticides. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have some interesting results from, from that biocrop project. So I'll just finish off by saying thanks uh, to everyone in the lab and their collaborators, and I'd be happy to take any questions.